Okay, so what I want to do is, you know, uh, try to tell you about uh, some other important theorems which are connected with uh, uh, normal families. Okay, so uh, the theorem that we are going to look at today is called Royden's theorem. Okay, and uh, the uh, uh, the whole point about uh, the theorem is that you know uh, whether you can decide uh, the normality of a family if you have a growth condition on the derivatives of the functions in the family. Okay. So, remember that normality is connected with, uh, the, with the derivatives. Okay. Montel's theorem will tell you that you know if for a family of analytic functions, normality is the same as saying that the, the, uh, the you know the, uh, uh, the original functions are themselves uh, normally uniformly bounded. Okay. And the, the first Cauchy, the, the, the Cauchy integral formula <coughs> will then tell you that the derivatives will also be you know normally uniformly bounded and and the normal uniform boundedness of the derivatives will give rise to equicontinuity okay and then you are in an arzela ascoli kind of situation and you will get uh, normal sequential compactness okay and then you, the same kind of thing uh, the, there is the same kind of philosophy with marty uh, with with <coughs> marty's theorem as well because uh, in that case, you are looking at meromorphic functions, and then the theorem says that the normality of a family of meromorphic functions is 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 directly the same as uh, the 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 normal boundedness of the spherical derivatives. Okay, so you have to take derivatives with respect to the spherical metric. All right, and then uh, uh, so uh, but mind you, normally whenever uh, you have a family of functions uh, that uh, whose derivatives uh, 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 for example, if you have a family of functions which satisfy a Lipschitz condition, okay, uh, that is the difference in the function values is uh, are bounded by a constant times the difference in the variable values. Okay. Uh, this is the kind of condition that you will get uh, if for example, the derivatives are bounded. Okay. So, basically if you have a Lipschitz type condition, which is how you must think of a condition where your derivatives are bounded. Whenever you have a Lipschitz type condition, then you are actually getting equicontinuity, and then you can ap apply uh, Arzela Ascoli theorem to get uh, to get normal sequential compactness. Okay, so uh, the, so here is uh, uh, what we are going to look at today is uh, uh, Royden's theorem, which says that you if you have a family of uh, functions, okay, and um, assume that uh, the the derivatives of the family. So I'm I'm looking at uh, either I can look at uh, analytic functions or I can look at meromorphic functions. The only thing is that if I look at analytic functions, uh, 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 I mean I, I must consider the derivatives where they defined. Okay, So, if they are meromorphic functions, I should not worry about the derivatives at the poles and I am not, uh, in, in principle I am not looking at the spherical derivatives. Okay, I am looking at the ordinary derivatives at all points other than poles. Okay, So, if the derivatives grow uh, as uh, at most like an increasing function of uh, the original functions, okay, then uh, the family is normal. This is Royden's theorem. Okay, so let me so let me write this down. Uh, so Royden's theorem. Uh, suppose script F is a family of analytic functions. Uh, on a domain D, the complex plane, such that there exists a strictly increasing function uh, <coughs> so this is the function psi from uh, non negative real numbers to non negative real numbers. Uh, so, it is a strictly increasing function such that the, the modulus of the derivatives of the functions in the family they are bounded by psi of the modulus of the functions. So this is the <coughs> this is the uh, this is the condition in Royden's theorem. The condition is that 
the, the derivatives of your uh, uh, the functions in your family the way they grow is at most like an increasing function of the growth of the original functions. So, what is what I what is there on the right side is psi of mod f ok, mod f indicates the growth of f ok in models and psi of mod f is psi of the growth of uh, it, it, it says that the, the uh, psi of mod f will be an increasing function of mod f because psi is an increasing function ok. So, what you are saying is that the the the, uh, the derivatives grow as an increasing function of the original functions ok. Uh, then then uh, the family f is normal ok and uh, the significance of this is that you know uh, because of Montel's theorem this will tell you that the family is uh, going to be normally uniformly bounded ok. It also tells you that the derivatives will also be normally uniformly bounded ok. It is a it is a very powerful condition all right. The point is that when you look at this condition it looks as if uh, you know uh, the derivatives are growing pretty fast ok. Uh, it looks as if the derivatives are growing uh, uh, see if what you want is the derivatives to be bounded on compact subsets ok. You want derivatives to be normally uniformly bounded that means you should you want them to be uniformly bounded on compact subsets which means that on a compact subset you want a uniform bound ok. You do not uh, you, but the point is that uh, what this says is the derivatives are growing but the growth is at most like an increasing function of the modulus of the original functions ok. So, it looks uh, it's, it uh, directly does not look as if uh, this is going to lead to normality, but the theorem is that it does lead to normality and, and the reason is that this is also a kind of uh, uh, boundedness of derivatives with respect to a different kind of metric on the Riemann sphere which can be defined using psi. So, that is the whole idea ok. So, uh, so, let me write this, uh, uh, let me write uh, uh, the proof, so here is the proof, uh, probably I will use proof. Firstly, assume that, uh, that uh, psi of t is uh, you know uh, uh, less than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 ok, suppose you assume this. suppose you assume this all right because I want to con then consider the case when it is greater than or equal to 1 plus t square by 2 suppose I assume this all right. Uh, then you see uh, if you calculate the spherical derivative uh, of the of any function in the family what I will get is f hash of z is what it is going to be by definition 2 times mod f dash of z divided by 1 plus mod f of z the whole square this is what it is. All right, this is a spherical derivative. Mind you, these are all analytic functions, but I can also consider them as meromorphic functions, and spherical derivatives are defined, okay, uh, even for meromorphic functions. So now you see uh, the the condition is that mod f dash, mod f dash is supposed to be uh, less than or equal to psi of mod f. Okay, this is the this is the condition in the in the theorem. So I can write this is less than or equal to two psi of mod f. Uh, divided by 1 plus mod f the whole square all right, but then uh, 2 psi of mod f by 1 plus mod f the whole square is less than or equal to 1 that is because of this ok. So, if I if I assume psi of t is less than or equal to 1 plus t square by 2 then all the spherical derivatives are bounded on the whole domain and of course, you know uh, if the spherical derivatives are bounded on the whole domain then Marty's theorem tells you that this is equivalent to the normality of the family. So, this is equal to normality of the family considered as a family of meromorphic functions, but that is also the same as the normality of, of, of the family considered as a family of analytic functions only the only thing is that you should allow the possibility that you can have normal convergence to the function which is identically infinity ok when you consider the spherical metric ok. So, uh, so you know uh, the case when psi of t is less than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 is trivial alright it is uh, it is just because of Marty's theorem. Uh, then uh, then by Marty's theorem 
So, let me write this down uh, uh, f is normal. Okay. So, so assume the other possibility that psi of t is greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 for uh, beyond a certain stage <coughs> t greater than or equal to t naught. Okay. I can replace the function psi of t by another function for which the same condition holds with uh, t greater than or equal to 0. That means I am saying that I can without loss of generality I can assume t greater t naught equal to 0 and why is that so uh, because you, you, you just have to put psi on of t to be equal to uh, psi of uh, uh, t uh, plus t naught if you do this all right then you know psi of t plus t naught is uh, is certainly going to be e is certainly going to be equal to uh, is going to be greater than or equal to 1 1 plus t plus t naught the whole squared by 2 that is uh, if t is greater than or equal to 0 okay so the mind you psi uh, psi of t is greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 provided the t is greater than t naught so i need uh, 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 i need t plus t naught greater than t naught and that is the same as t greater than or equal to 0 okay so i will get this but then of course this is greater than or equal to 1 plus uh, t squared by 2 okay and uh, uh, so the uh, so uh, you know if if psi of t uh, is greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 for t greater than or equal to t naught I can replace psi of t by psi 1 of t with psi 1 of t greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 for all t greater than or equal to 0 okay and the point is that psi 1 of t is certainly greater than psi of t because psi 1 of t is psi of t plus something and psi is increasing. So uh, psi 1 of t uh, will be also greater than or equal to psi of t this will also be true okay and uh, the, the point is that uh, 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 this is this is of course because psi is increasing okay and therefore what will happen is that you would have got a mod f dash uh, is going to be less than or equal to uh, psi of t which is less than or equal to psi 1 of t okay. So all these considerations tell you that without loss of generality you can assume psi of t uh, to be uh, uh, greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 for t greater than or equal to 0 okay. So without loss of generality generality we may assume we may assume that uh, that psi of t is greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 for uh, t greater than or equal to 0 okay you can do that now uh, namely if not uh, you replace psi by psi 1 all right and call psi 1 as psi if you want all right again. So uh, uh, and then the next reduction I am going to make is that I am going to assume that psi is also uh, continuously differentiable function of t that is because uh, you know psi is a monotonic function okay and I can always approximate it uh, uh, to by a continuously differentiable function okay. So, uh, um, uh, uh, we we can also assume that psi dash of t exists and is continuous. This is the same as saying psi is C one. Okay, uh, it's a continuously continuously differentiable function. You you can do that because after all you can replace psi by any bigger function. Okay and you can replace psi by a bigger function which is smooth okay you can always do that and well uh, uh, now you know what what one is going to do you are going to one is going to use this psi to give, give a metric on the on the Riemann sphere okay and look at the induced metric on the domain in your in the complex plane. So what you do is uh, uh, for uh, z1 comma z2 in the uh, uh, in the domain okay define uh, a d psi of z1 comma z2 to be equal to okay uh, you see you take integral from z1 to z2 
okay along any uh, smooth path or along any uh, even piece wise smooth smooth path even a contour okay and what you integrate is that so this is the int you integrate mod d zeta by psi of mod zeta okay see notice and and of course you know you have to take the uh, uh, you have to take the uh, uh, infimum of all this so you, this is this integral is over gamma so in, infimum over all gamma where gamma is a uh, gamma is a smooth or piecewise smooth path from z1 to z2 you you take all possible paths contours from z1 to z2 integrate along uh, that this uh, this this quantity mod d zeta by psi of mod zeta you do this okay and notice that you know uh, 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 the point is psi psi is see try to understand psi is greater than psi of t is greater than 1 plus t squared by 2 so 1 by psi will be bounded by 2 by 1 plus t squared 1 by psi of t will be less than or equal to 2 by 1 plus t squared okay and 2 by 1 plus t squared is uh, uh, you know uh, that is the uh, that is the form of the uh, integrand that you will have to put when you want the spherical metric okay and uh, 2 by 1 plus t squared is bounded as t goes to infinity if you want right so it's a so the the integral is always nicely defined all right so you t and you take this infimum all right then the point is that this is a this gives you a metric on the uh, 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 this d sub psi the way i have written it uh, gives a metric on the uh, uh, on the riemann sphere okay uh, or you can think of it also as a metric on d uh, d considered as uh, d identified with its image in the riemann sphere if you want okay but uh, the point is that this gives a metric okay and uh, you know in particular the, an, an infimum of a set of quantities is always uh, you know less than or equal to each of those quantities so if for gamma i had taken the straight line path from z1 to z2 this is also less than or equal to integral from z1 to z2 okay uh, is straight line path straight line segment from z1 to z2 of this quantity mod d zeta by uh, psi of uh, mod zeta okay and the point is that uh, see but the point is that this is this is bounded see 1 by psi zeta is bounded by 2 by 1 plus mod zeta the whole squared because that is exactly uh, that is this condition right uh, we have psi of we have assumed psi of t is greater than or equal to 1 plus t squared by 2 okay so 1 by psi of zeta uh, psi of mod zeta is going to be uh, uh, this is going to be bounded by 2 by 1 plus mod zeta the whole square okay you have this all right so this is bounded by integral from z1 to z2 mod d zeta 2 mod z d zeta by 1 plus mod zeta the whole square okay but what is this this is actually the spherical length from uh, z1 to z2 so this is just d spherical of z1 comma z2 so what you have proved is that the uh, d sub psi is a metric which is bounded above by the spherical metric okay but the point is that for this uh, the, the, for the spherical metric the whole riemann sphere itself is compact okay it's compact with respect to the spherical metric because you know the spherical distance the maximum spherical distance is uh, there is a there is a maximum to it it is uh, you know it is the it is going to be just the uh, half the circumference of the of a sphere of radius 1 okay it, it is going to be uh, uh, that namely it is, it is going to be just pi that is the maximum distance you can get on the riemann sphere the riemann sphere is a sphere of radius 1 okay then any great circle on it will have radius 2 pi i mean we will have circumference 2 pi okay and the maximum uh, distance you can get is from the for example from a point to its antipodal point for example from the north pole to the south pole north pole representing infinity south pole representing zero and the maximum distance you can get is pi so see it's a space with finite diameter and and it's compact okay and the point is that uh, in a in a for a compact space okay if one metric is bounded above by another metric then these two metrics are uniformly equivalent okay so the point is that uh, since uh, 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 the riemann sphere uh, uh, so uh, the riemann sphere 
uh, sphere or you can you can just consider C union infinity or, or, or the extended complex plane uh, is compact uh, uh, with respect to uh, the spherical metric. Okay. Uh, we have uh, that uh, uh, the these two metrics uh, d psi and d s are strongly equivalent. So, uh, at this point let me very quickly tell you about this strong equivalence. See, if you have two metrics on a space, we generally say that these two metrics are equivalent if they induce the same topology. Okay. This is called weak equivalence. Okay. Now, what is strong equivalence? A strong equivalence is a condition that each metric is bounded by the other metric by up to a constant, an absolute constant. So, if you have two metrics d1 and d2 on a space x, we to, to say that x, uh, that to say that d1 and d2, d2 are equivalent for x means to say that the topology induced by d1 is the same as topology induced by d2. Okay. One of the sufficient conditions is that every ball in D1 contains a ball in D2 and every ball in D2 contains a ball in D1, okay. the nesting of balls condition as it is called. Okay. So, this is just to say that the two metrics are topologically equivalent, but there is something called strong equivalence. Strong equivalence is that the two metrics, each metric is bounded above by the other metric up to multiplication by an absolute constant. So, if the two metrics are D1 and D2, you should get d1 less than or equal to lambda d2 and you should get d2 less than or equal to mu d1. You should be able to find such absolute constants. If you are able to find such absolute constants, these metrics are said to be strongly equivalent. Now, of course, strongly equivalent means equivalent, but what is the beauty about the strong equivalence? It is the following. See, if you on a space, suppose you are considering functions, continuous functions, okay. Then if you change uh, the metric to an equivalent metric, that is you change it up to weak equivalence. Okay. That is you change the metric by another metric which gives the same topology, continuity will not be affected because after all you have not changed the topology continuity uh, the, just depends on the topology. But the problem is uniform continuity will become a problem. Okay. If you have a uniformly continuous function okay, uh, on, a, on, a, on a subset, suppose you have a function which is continuous which is uniformly continuous on a subset with respect to one metric. If you replace that metric by an equivalent metric, the uniform continuity may not be uh, preserved. If you want also the uniform continuity to be preserved, you should replace ne it ne the metric necessarily by a strongly equivalent metric, not just by any other metric which will give the same topology. So, what will happen is that if you change the metric by just uh, another equivalent metric, namely you do not uh, that you are only worried about the topology, what will happen is that a function which is continuous uniformly with respect to one metric may fail to be uniformly continuous with respect to the other metric. But if you want to preserve uniform continuity, you have to replace uh, the metric only by a strongly equivalent metric. Okay. And the point is that you see if you have two metrics on a space and such that uh, one metric bounds is an upper bound for the other metric and the bounding metric with respect to the bounding metric the space is compact, then it also means that the, the uh, uh, some multiple of the, uh, of, the, of the smaller metric, uh, some, mul some multiple of the smaller metric also bounds the larger metric that can be proved okay, because of compactness. Therefore, uh, just uh, the bounding of one metric by another uh, on a compact space where the bigger metric where the space is compact with respect to the bigger metric will tell you that they are strongly equivalent. Okay. Now, you know why I am saying all this, I am just saying all this to tell you that you know if you are looking at a family of functions you know to decide uniform continuity uh, uh, with respect to the spherical metric, I can as well decide uniform continuity with uh, respect to the uh, uh, the metric uh, any metric that is strongly equal to the spherical metric okay and uh, uh, so this applies to uniform continuity uh, it, it applies to equicontinuity and things like that right so we are now more or less done see uh, now what you do is that uh, now you look at the following thing uh, uh, so if you calculate uh, for uh, small f in script f uh, uh, what happens is that if, if I if I calculate the the uh, under the new metric d sub psi, if I calculate f z1, f z2, okay, what will I get? Uh, this is going to be infimum over all uh, contours from z1 to z2, uh, integral from z1 to z2 
along uh, that contour gamma of uh, uh, mod d uh, zeta by psi of mod zeta this is what it is with you know the substitution zeta equal to f of z okay this is the definition right and uh, you well uh, what is this going to give me see uh, uh, notice that this is uh, being an infimum this is certainly less than or equal to you know uh, uh, the the uh, the integral over the straight line segment okay so if i take this integral over z1 to z2 and i took take the straight line segment what i'm going to get is mod d zeta uh, 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 by uh, uh, psi of mod zeta and of course i have to put psi equal, uh, zeta equal to fz so if i do that i'm i'm going to get integral from z1 to z2 along the straight line segment uh, of I will get mod f dash of uh, z into mod d z because that is what mod d zeta will be okay uh, and 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 I will get mod uh, divided by psi of mod f z okay. But then what is my what is the uh, what is the hypothesis in the theorem the hypothesis in, in Royden's theorem is that the numerator mod uh, the, the numerator of the integrand mod f dash of z is bounded by uh, psi of mod f z. So, it means that this integrand is less than or equal to 1. So, you know what it means is that I will get this is less than or equal to integral from z 1 to z 2 over the straight line segment uh, of uh, you know uh, mod d z. But you know integrating mod d z will give you just the Euclidean metric okay. So, this will be see it will simply be mod z 1 minus z 2. This is, all, this is all that I am going to get okay. So, uh, alright. So, uh, what have we proved? We, pro we have proved therefore uh, that what is there on the left side? On the left side I have d psi of f z 1 uh, z 1 comma f z is you have proved that this d psi of f z 1 f z 2 is bounded by is mod z 1 minus z 2 that is a Lipschitz condition that is a Lipschitz condition on f with respect to the new metric d psi on the Riemann sphere. But the moment you have a, a, a Lipschitz condition it, it implies equicontinuity. So, it means that the family f is equicontinuous okay. This family script f is equicontinuous with respect to the metric d psi. But then d psi is strongly equivalent to d s. Therefore, the family script f is also equicontinuous with respect to the spherical metric. But if it is equicontinuous with respect to the spherical metric, I am in the I am uh, I can use as uh, as in the proof of Marty's theorem, uh, I can use uh, the Arzela Ascoli theorem and I can use a diagonalization argument to conclude that the family is normal, and that is the proof. Okay. So uh, uh, thus script F is equicontinuous on uh, uh, d with respect to the spherical metric, but since uh, the spherical metric uh, I mean sorry with respect the, the script f is equivalent on d with respect to d psi, but since d psi is strongly equivalent to the spherical metric d s script f is equicontinuous. on d with respect to uh, uh, the spherical metric. Now, uh, by the Arzela Ascoli theorem and the diagonalization argument uh, we conclude script f is normal it's a normal family okay so that's the proof of roydens theorem so the whole idea is that this this uh, this roydens condition uh, uh, is actually uh, the roydens condition translates to uh, a lipschitz condition when you use 
different metric on the Riemann sphere. Okay. So, uh, what is what is the advantage of uh, uh, what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is uh, we can apply it to an example like this. Uh, uh, let uh, D be a domain uh, and uh, script F be uh, the set of all uh, uh, functions f uh, analytic on D such that you know mod f dash of z is bounded by e power mod f z. Look at look at functions like this. Mod f dash is bounded by e power mod f. Okay. Now then this family is normal because uh, here e power mod f is the function e power t and e power t is of course a smooth uh, is a, it's an increasing function of t for t greater than or equal to 0 and you can apply Royden's theorem okay so uh, so you know you get this uh, nice uh, uh, condition that you know if you are if you are looking at a family of analytic functions whose derivatives grow at most as the uh, exponent grow exponentially as the functions okay the derivatives are f dash uh, the, de the derivatives of the functions are given by f dash okay and uh, they are moduli mod f dash that is the rate at which uh, f dash grow and mod f dash is bounded by is at most like e power mod f that is a condition uh, but the so so the uh, the function involved is e power t which is an increasing function of t all right and uh, you know it uh, mind you this is for any domain for example if you are taking the domain to be the whole plane okay uh, e power uh, mod f okay could uh, e, e power mod f is a kind of exponential growth okay uh, the and it seems to be uh, even if you put uh, mod f dash is equal to e power mod f okay it looks like the derivatives are growing exponentially as the original functions okay but so it looks as if you know the derivatives they seem it seems as if the derivatives cannot be normally uh, uniformly bounded it looks because whenever there is something exp growing exponentially you are worried about boundedness okay so if you take a compact subset of the domain all right uh, one is worried whether uh, you know whether the derivatives will be bounded but the truth is it, they will be and it is not obvious, it is not it is not an obvious result. What you have is the derivatives are growing exponentially okay, as the original functions and from that trying to conclude that the derivatives are bounded uniformly on any compact subset is a great thing. So you see Royden's theorem will, can, will now apply, it will tell you that the that this family is normal but if this family is normal Montel's theorem will tell you again. Uh, or or you can directly even use uh, Marty's theorem. Marty's theorem will tell you the spherical derivatives are bounded. Okay, and if you want, use you can use Montel's theorem, which will tell you that the original functions are themselves normally uniformly bounded. Okay. The, so if you take a compact subset uh, of of the domain, then the uh, the the functions are themselves uniformly bounded, and the Cauchy integral formulas will then tell you that the derivatives of the functions are also uh, normally uniformly bounded they are that they are bounded on every compact subset which is not at all obvious because the derivatives seem to be growing uh, uh, exponentially as the functions so that is the significance of this uh, this theorem okay and it has got to do with uh, uh, the study of normal families and uh, that's the reason why i wanted to present it here okay so uh, so i'll stop here so let me complete this sentence uh, i'll just say uh, that uh, then by Royden's theorem script f is normal in particular uh, the derivatives of f belonging to script f are uniformly bounded on compact subsets of D.
which is uh, which is quite surprising given that the original condition was just that the derivatives are growing exponentially with respect to their functions.